Welcome everyone. So we're going to continue our discussion of monetary policy and at this point we're going to focus on the Federal Reserve which is the primary in different countries it's called different things basically it's your nation's central bank and the primary function of the Federal Reserves is to work to manage money supply and interest rates. So as I had explained before the Fed acts like a banker's bank uh, it regulates banks, uh, it makes rules uh, about the reserves banks should use, it has standards that banks need to follow in terms of the safety of the investments or loans they make using uh, the deposits of their depositors. And in exchange for all that, the Fed acts as a banker's bank. It acts as the lender of last resort. If there is a run on banks, if there's other kinds of issues, the Fed will step in. The Fed will also provide federal deposit insurance and make sure that people's checking accounts are safe. And the Fed also has rules about what counts as reserves that banks can use, which includes cash and pools and most often and usually includes particularly deposits that the banks themselves have with the Federal Reserve. Just as I have a deposit with the bank, the bank in turn has a deposit with the Federal Reserve. And so this allows the Fed an oversight and mechanism to engage in control over this system. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by learning three of the four policies the Federal Reserve uses. The fourth policy isn't from the supply or banking side, though it does have an impact on banks. Uh, it's a little bit from the demand side, so it'll make a nice segue into the demand side. So we're going to start with the first three policies, move to the fourth. So the Fed in oil currently uses four policies that it can use to manage the interest rate. So the first, obviously, is that the Fed can change the required reserve ratio, right? If you change the required reserve ratio, you are essentially changing the proportion of excess reserves and therefore you are changing the number uh, of, of loans banks can make and therefore you are changing the volume of money that is behind or, or that can be carried by a certain level of reserves. This is a very uh, blunt instrument. It's not a good instrument to use uh, for fine-grained tactics, partly because, think about it, say the Fed wants to reduce the money supply. It increases the reserve required ratio. But here's the problem. The way that works is by increasing the res res reserve required ratio, the Fed is forcing banks to call in loans. When it calls in loans and loans get paid off, checking accounts get extinguished and that reduces the money supply. But if the Fed does this very abruptly, then that is a very abrupt and sudden and sharp reduction in money supply that depends on forcing banks to really contract existing loans. So usually what the Fed would do if it was going to use reserve required ratio, there is usually a phase in period, there's usually some kind of notification. It's actually not the preferred instrument. The other thing the Fed can do is that it can use the Federal Open Market Commission to engage in what are called open market operations. Here is what open market operations are. Open market operations essentially is the Fed itself going into the open market and buying and selling treasury bills. The Fed doesn't issue its own stocks and bonds. Those are issued by the government. Treasury bills, things like that are issued by the government. But what the Fed is doing is it's essentially buying and selling government bonds. So what happens when the, when the Fed buys a bond? So, you know, when I buy a bond, I write a check against my checking account. I give it to the person I'm buying the bond from. They deposit it. And what happens is I get debited. Their bank gets credited. Right. So what that means is there is a reshuffling of checking accounts, but it's not like 
all that's happened in the total economy is I got a bond, somebody else got a checking account. There's no like total change in the overall economy in terms of stocks and bonds versus uh, uh, checking accounts and so on. But what happens when the Fed buys a treasury bill? So what happens when the Fed buys a treasury bill? It writes a check, same as I do. The difference is the check is written by the Fed against itself. So when whoever it is deposits it, they get credited. And when their bank goes to the Fed, it's just like loans. The Fed says, okay, here, I'm going to create an account. Like I'm going to credit your account. The difference is when the, the Fed credits the bank's account, that's reserves. So what happens is by buying treasury bills, the Fed is essentially sending reserves into the system. So by the simple act of buying treasury bill, the Fed can increase reserves and then increased reserves, as we know, should be able to increase the money supply because with increased reserves, bank can make more loans because they now have excess reserves and so on. Conversely, if the Fed wants to absorb money, reduce the money supply, what it will do is it will sell treasury bills. When it sells treasury bills and somebody buys that, if I buy the treasury bill that the Fed sold, I will write, you know, I, I will buy it and I will write a check. And when I write the check and my bank deposits it, the Fed is like, okay, fine, you credit me. And then the bank credits the Fed. Essentially, the bank has less reserves. Uh, and, and so the total amount of reserves in the system go down. So by the simple act of buying and selling treasury bills in the open market, the Fed can actually change the level of reserves in the economy. And open market operations is something that the Fed and many central banks use on a fairly reasonable basis in order to fine tune and adjust the money supply of a nation. The third thing the Fed can do this is often called the discount rate is that the Fed can essentially change the interest at which it makes loans to banks. So just like I can go to the bank and ask for a loan, banks can go to the Fed and ask for a loan. And banks will do this if they look around and they say, hey, there's really great opportunities there. I wish I had more reserves so that I could go out and make loans, right? And so what they do is they go to the Fed. And if the Fed, and they borrow from the Fed, and that's the rate at which they borrow from the Fed is called the discount rate. So what the Fed does with the discount rate is that it says, okay, if you borrow from me, you can borrow reserves from me. So banks essentially borrow from the Fed that makes reserves and then they relend those reserves and in the process, they create money supply. The thing with this is, as I said, this one is a blunt instrument. These two are pretty decent at moving things around and at uh, fine tuning the volume of reserves in the system. But they depend on there being no excess reserves in the system. Because if a bank has excess reserves, even if the Fed sort of goes ahead and tries to expand money supply by uh, purchasing treasury bills and so on, what happens is that, okay, fine, the bank gets reserves. But if banks have anxiety, they don't see many opportunities out there, they will not lend it out. They will hang on to their excess reserves. We like to think that banks always lend out any excess reserve. But this really assumes that from the bank's perspective, there is tons and tons of very good opportunities out there. If it's not a whole bunch of opportunities, banks may not lend out. So when you've got a ton of excess reserves already sloshing around the system, Keynes sometimes call this pushing on a string. You can't really get 
the, uh, the, the money supply to respond, especially for expansion. So what the Fed has been doing is that the fourth policy, and this is really the one that it has been doing since 2008, is that the Fed now essentially offers an interest on reserves held by the Fed. So even if banks have excess reserves and so on, what the Fed says is that kind of like how I got opportunities with my bank if I make deposits and I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. My bank sometimes has these deals, right? It's got certain kinds of accounts which are interest bearing accounts where I can write checks against them, but they will earn me an interest. Not a whole lot of interest, but some interest. And so in the same way, the Fed finally started offering to pay interest to banks for the accounts that banks hold with the Fed. And what that means is that allows the Fed to set the interest rate directly because of the term structure of the interest rate. So whereas so far I've been talking about through the money supply and I still have to bring the demand side in, remember, in order to figure out how a market sets interest rates, I need money supply and money demand. Much of what the Fed does of late is also to try and set the interest rate in a slightly different manner. So let's integrate demand, look at what happens when demand and supply cross, and then go back and take a look at these four policies. Thank you.